Welcome to part two of the lesson on phylogeny. In this lesson, we're going to focus on learning how to identify clades, how to tell the difference between a monophyletic versus a paraphyletic versus a polyphyletic grouping. I know that's a mouthful. And then lastly, I'll introduce you to drawing a type of evolutionary tree called a cladogram using derived characters. So how do we begin building a phylogenetic tree? When you have a group of species, once you've identified the homologies, and the homologies can be morphological or molecular or other types, then you can use those homologies to begin grouping the species into clades. A clade is a group that includes the ancestral species and all of its descendants. So let's take a look at this very simple example. If I showed you pictures of these four animals, you would probably notice that the domestic cat has more similarities with the wild leopard cat than it does with the dog or the wolf. And the dog and the wolf are more similar to each other than they are to either cat. So you could begin creating groupings such as this. The domestic cat and the leopard cat could be one clade, and the dog and the wolf could be another clade. Now, clades can be nested within bigger clades. What I mean by that is if you group, if you compared all four of these animals to another animal, such as a pig, you might notice that the cats and the dog and the wolf share more similarities with each other, such as being carnivores, than they uh, do to a pig. This pig could be considered an outgroup and I'll come back to this term later. So let's summarize. The two cats could be one clade, the dog and the wolf could be another clade, and all four of them together could be one bigger clade that's distinct from our outgroup, the pig. Let's come back to the example from part one of the phylogeny lesson, where we looked at the evolutionary tree of different fox species. And with this, we'll examine clades more closely. So this grouping could be considered one clade. It has the ancestor and all of the ancestor's descendants. This could be another clade. I also said that clades can be nested within bigger clades. So this entire grouping could be one clade. It includes all of the descendants of one common ancestor. Now, what grouping would not be considered a clade? Let me change the pen color to show that. Okay, so a grouping that would not be a clade would be if, say, I considered these two to be one clade. That's not a clade because while they can be traced back to a common ancestor, I did not include all of the descendants from that common ancestor into that clade. Or another example would be this grouping in red would not be a clade. All of these can be traced back to a common ancestor, but I missed out on the red fox. That can't be a clade. The clade would have to include all of the descendants from this particular ancestor. Now this next part can be a little tricky. I'll talk about some vocabulary words about different types of groupings. So a clade is the same thing as a monophyletic group. A monophyletic group has the ancestral species and all of its descendants. However, we also have these two types of groupings. A paraphyletic group includes the ancestral species and some, but not all, of its descendants. And a polyphyletic group include species that are descended from several different ancestors, but fails to include other species that are also descended from those ancestors. Now this can be a little difficult to visualize, so I'll give you some examples. 
So let's first focus on monophyletic versus paraphyletic. So remember, a monophyletic includes the ancestor and all of its descendants. So mammals, all mammals could be considered a monophyletic group. They all come from one common ancestor. We could also consider this grouping, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, to be one monophyletic group because this grouping includes the ancestor and all of its descendants. So what would be a paraphyletic group? Well, a paraphyletic group could be fish. If you consider fish to be a natural grouping, you would actually be making a mistake because all fish can be traced back to a common ancestor, but amphibians, reptiles, and mammals also came from that ancestor. So when I say fish, I should also be saying, well, that also includes mammals and that also includes reptiles and birds. So a paraphyletic group includes the ancestral species and some but not all of its descendants. Why do we bother using this, um, this particular terminology? Well, this terminology is basically a pointer to a mistake in our language. Our language, such as using the term fish, came to be before we knew about evolutionary relationships. So we consider this grouping of organisms, fish, as one grouping because they all look similar, but we don't include within that grouping other species that also descended from that same ancestor. So paraphyletic is a pointer to a mistake in our everyday language. So now what about a polyphyletic group? An example of a polyphyletic group would be if you considered the cactuses to be part of the same group as the euphorbias. Now in the past, before people knew about their evolutionary history, they grouped these plants together because they look really similar. So again, a polyphyletic group is kind of like a pointer to a mistake. A polyphyletic group includes species that came from two or more different ancestors, such as the separate ancestor of the Cactaceae and the ancestor of the Euphorbiaceae, but fails to include other species that came from the same ancestor. In this case, this is a simplified uh, tree. So there are many other species that came from these ancestors. Another example of a polyphyletic group would be if you've heard of the term protists. In the past, protists were considered one grouping, but that was actually a mistake because we then found out that some protists are more closely related to plants and other protists are more closely related to animals. So just like the term paraphyletic, the term polyphyletic is a pointer to a mistake in our understanding. This next picture shows a visual summary of what we just discussed. So in yellow, we have a monophyletic group. Monophyletic includes the ancestor and all of its descendants. In blue is a paraphyletic group, which has the ancestor and some, but not all, of its descendants. And then in red, we have a polyphyletic group, which includes species that came from different ancestors and fails to include many other species that also came from those ancestors. So now that you know what the term monophyletic group or clade means, let's talk about how to create an evolutionary tree called a cladogram. In a cladogram, all of the species that you want to compare are referred to as the in-group, and they are compared against a species that's the out-group. The out-group is the one that's the most different from all of them. It's our basis of comparison. So all of these can be compared against that out-group. The way we figure out the cladogram is we need to use something called shared derived characters. 
So let's talk about what this means versus something called an ancestral character. So an ancestral character is something that evolved in the ancestor of all of the species you want to compare. So let's say everyone in our in-group has a backbone. They're all vertebrates. Then that would be an ancestral character for this group. And then let's say C and D have four limbs, but B doesn't. Then the presence of four limbs would be a shared derived character. It is derived because it only came to be in this lineage after they split off from B and they share it together, hence shared derived character. To draw a cladogram, you will be given a group of species and then information about which characteristics are present or absent in those species. So you could be given a table such as this one, where the pluses indicate the presence of that characteristic. So for example, in the backbone, is present in all of them except the sea star. But the bear is the only one that has all of these characteristics, including the presence of milk. So one way to begin drawing the cladogram is to draw a line such as this. And I'm going to first focus on the sea star. The sea star is our outgroup, the one that's the most different. And I will draw a line here, indicate the lineage that led to sea stars. The rest of these are all vertebrates, so they all have a backbone. You'll notice the shark has the backbone, but nothing else, whereas the rest of these have at least one more additional characteristic. So next, I'm going to draw a line representing sharks. And then I'm going to use a little mark to indicate the evolution of a backbone. So this shows that the lineage that led to all the rest of the organisms here, all the rest should have a backbone. So everything to the right of this mark will have a backbone. So now let's look at the rest of these. The crocodile and the bear both have additional characteristics besides the four limbs. But the frog only has a backbone and four limbs, none of the rest. So I'm going to show um, that the frog branched off at this point and put a little mark here to indicate the evolution of four limbs. So the frog has both four limbs and a backbone. The shark also has a backbone but does not have four limbs. The four limbs evolved after the lineage that led to sharks split off. Now the crocodile and the bear, they both have an amniotic egg, but only the bear has milk. So the amniotic egg is a shared derived trait. And so I'm going to indicate with a little mark here, the evolution of the amniotic egg. And so the crocodile has an amniotic egg, four limbs, and a backbone, but it does not have milk. So milk was a derived trait that is unique actually to mammals. So the bear is our representative of mammals. So we'll put the bear here at the end of the line. And so what this shows is that the bears, bears have all of these derived traits crocodile has all of them except milk. So there's other ways of drawing cladograms and the tables that you'll be given won't always be this nicely organized where you could just go from left to right. You'll have to look more closely to see which characteristics are in which animals. But we will do some of that practice in class. So let's summarize this lesson. First, I discussed how to identify clades. Then I talked about what a monophyletic group is, and a monophyletic group is the only one that shows the evolutionary history. 
whereas paraphyletic and polyphyletic groupings are more like pointers to mistakes in either our everyday language or our previous understandings. And then lastly, I introduce you to drawing a cladogram using derived characters.